this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the Final Four of the 2021 Men's College Basketball Tournament with Adam Stanko getting his thoughts on both games, championship outrights, Gonzaga versus the field, and also some NBA futures mixed in there as well, coming off of last week's trade deadline. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Dr. Ed Feng, you can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. And Ed, Elite Eight just wrapped up. The final four is now set. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. A little bit tired, staying up for these games. Uh, can't really watch them in the morning when you have to do a 9 a.m. radio gig like I did yep. this morning. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And, you know, last night the Michigan game was kind of interesting because the Thursday before the tournament tipped on Friday, I – I released an episode of uh, Bracket Wisdom. It was my bracket analysis, and I did everything based on uh, preseason AP poll, which is a surprising predictor. So uh, it turned out to be maybe the worst predictive episode I've, I've ever done <laughs> in my life. I talked about Michigan State. I talked about how the North Carolina-Wisconsin winner was going to give Baylor a game. Um, talked about how there was no chance Illinois was going to get a game in the, the round of 32. Um I don't know why I'm rehashing all these things. Anyways, uh, you know, it's kind of one of these things that happened, you know, right before the start of the tournament. There were certainly less downloads on that episode just because of the timing of everything. But I did it anyways. Uh, but last night, so one of the things I did say was that, you know, partially because of the AP Top 25 and, and partially because of some injury situations with the teams, I thought the one region where you get a surprise Final Four was the East, where you had Michigan as the one and, and Alabama as the two. And, and clearly I was sad to actually see that actually happen last night. Right. Uh, with with all my friends here in Ann Arbor. But uh, so it, I guess that result saved it from being a completely terrible uh, predictive episode for me. See, but Ed, here's the thing is it wasn't terrible because in, in a bracket pool, when you're picking Michigan State to win, you're picking Michigan State slash UCLA. So technically, if you pick oh. Michigan State to go <laughs> all the way effectively, <laughs> You could still be right. Like, I know you can edit it after the play-in game, so you could have said, oh, Michigan State lost, I'll dump out of this. But, like, you could have still hypothetically been right. So you may have inadvertently led people to a good bracket just by talking about Michigan State. Could have been. Could have been. So this is next Uh, level. All intentional. I mean, it was kind of it was such a it was such an interesting region, right? Because I had Michigan State and UCLA and BYU all really close. Yeah. So it was kind of like considered toss-ups, but. You know, UCLA, <laughs> it's been interesting. Their run's been great, and I don't want to take anything away from what they've accomplished on the court. But uh, the free throw shooting of the last two opponents has been dreadful. And then uh, they're also allowing 25% from three uh, through the entire tournament, which is just kind of unsustainable. So, uh, you know, props to them for making the Final Four. Uh, but I think especially against Gonzaga, it's going to be a short-lived Final Four. Well, let's go back to Michigan here, because obviously you're in Ann Arbor, like you mentioned do you think having Isaiah Livers would have made a difference there? Or was this just a situation where UCLA played well enough where it may not have mattered? Yeah, uh, it may have made a difference. I felt like no one on Michigan's team played a good game. And uh, that happens sometimes. And, you know, they were still within a, a basket of, of tying that game, pushing it to overtime, maybe even winning. You could definitely see, uh, you know, towards the end of the game, you could definitely see the loss of Livers because he's clearly their best shooter. I mean, it's not really even close. So uh, you want him taking that last shot as the best shooter. So that would have affected a little bit. I mean, Michigan didn't play well. That, that's that's all that that that's what it comes down to, uh, and especially on the offensive side of the ball. I thought they played fine defensively. I, mean, I know uh, UCLA hit a bunch of jump shots and and looked pretty good, but I thought their defense on Juzang was was good. Uh, it could have been better, but it was good. Uh, he just made shots. So they just, you know, they had a bad game on the offensive side of the ball, and that happens. We've got UCLA versus Gonzaga, Houston versus Baylor. We're going to break down both those games, the futures, the outrights, and everything with Adam Stanko. You can find him on Twitter at Naismith Lives. He is the host of the Rejecting the Screen podcast, also does NBA draft work for ESPN. So nice little overlap there. We can talk some college basketball with Adam, but then also get his thoughts on the NBA because tread deadline was last week. We can talk about which teams may be undervalued in the market still and also talk about NBA futures with uh, LeBron James and LaMelo Ball both banged up potentially giving us some outlets to bet in uh, some 
voting, some award voting as well in the NBA. So a lot to discuss with Adam, which we'll do here in just one second. But first, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast because it's a pretty popping part of the sports calendar. We got the Final Four now. After that, we got uh, the Masters coming up the next week, NFL Draft around the corner, Kentucky Derby. A lot of big stuff coming down the next couple of weeks. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread to get these podcasts as they go live each and every week. And if you like what you hear, make sure you leave us a rating and review as well. We'll get to the final four here in just a second. But first, got to go back to the last week, recap what went on in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, and see what takeaways we have from that. Covering the past. In our Sweet 16 betting preview podcast, we had Drew Martin on to talk about the men's Sweet 16. You can find him on Twitter at Drew Martin Bets. And both you and Drew were on a couple of different bets together. The first one was Arkansas minus 11.5 against Oral Roberts. You also had the Arkansas money line at minus 620. Oral Roberts actually up seven at the half. Arkansas did storm back there. So you got the money line win. Good thing you tossed that in there too. But they couldn't quite cover as Oral Roberts uh, lost that game by just two. So awesome run by Oral Roberts there, but Ed, the money line came through at least. That helps. Yeah, so we, we need to go back and uh, understand how lucky I was to win that money line. <laughs> uh, so Oral Roberts was down two. They have the ball. The best player gets a pretty clean look from three to win. Bounces off the rim. Uh, Arkansas advances. It was interesting. I mean, that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, it was a game in which I did not get closing line value. I think, I think it went from 11 and a half to 11 at the very end, uh, kind of thinking about that in terms of maybe I didn't understand the Arkansas team as well as I should have. I think I was, you know, I mean, Oral Roberts was was probably a little bit overrated. Um, they they played well, you know. Yeah. Tip your hat to them, but I think I was maybe a little bit off on Arkansas. Uh, you know, I I I talked about I don't know if I talked about it, but I have been talking about Moses Moody and he's their 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 lottery type pick player. He he had a bad tournament. He was nearly invisible uh, on that team. So it might have been something I missed there uh, on that game. Yeah, but they did get the win at least. So you did get the money line. Luck or not, you got it. So that definitely does count too. Uh, The second one was Loyola Chicago minus seven against Oregon State. And there, Loyola just got off to a really rough first half and couldn't quite make up for it. Uh, They didn't score for the final six minutes in the first half. Oregon State won by seven there. So obviously no cover. Ed, it's tough to win a bet when a team goes six minutes without scoring like that's just that's bad that's tough yep yeah you know i mean oregon state played well they moved on uh did get some closing line value with that because i think i bet it at seven and a half and it got to eight if i'm not mistaken it closed at seven and a half at uh will hill i think is where i pulled from uh for the final one so you got a half line there potentially eight at yours as well wait seven and a half or did i bet it at six and a half (laughs) anyway uh i felt a little bit better about that one with the closing line uh, value didn't work out, but that's how it goes sometimes. Uh, we had a good one by Drew because Drew was talking about the under for Syracuse Houston. It was at 140 when we talked. Uh, it actually closed at 140. I think it actually been 140 and a half, but didn't matter. Doesn't matter what number you got because the under hit. Uh, Houston won that one 62 to 46. It's 108 points, so the under hit by 32. So a big one there for Drew on that one for Syracuse versus Houston. Uh, Drew won a Gonzaga minus 13 against Creighton. They were up by 10 at the half and did not let off the gas. They went up winning by 18 there to help Drew get the cover. And uh, Gonzaga, 14-point favorites again this week. Uh, so and it's we talk a lot about, in college football, teams taking care of business and winning big when they should win big. And, like, Gonzaga kind of feels like the best representation of that that mindset. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're they're like Alabama in football, right? I mean, you look at your numbers, you give them a couple extra points in the point spread, and that's a fair number. And that's essentially what we're seeing with, uh, I mean, that's what we're seeing with Gonzaga. I think my numbers have them by like 12 and a half, 13 points, but we're giving them an extra point because they're that good. They made a very good USC team look like the junior varsity last night. I mean, they they just straight embarrassed them. So, um, you know, and I, and I think they are that good. You were talking about how some of the bracket analysis may not have been like uh, may not have been your best year for that. But I think the logic of it's hard to find an alternative to Gonzaga. Obviously, it's not done yet. It's not done yet. There are still right. two games left. But right. the analysis of finding a smaller bracket so you can allow yourself to pick the favorite in Gonzaga. I think that that specific advice we're seeing why that was the analysis for this year. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, so I want to be clear. So some of my bracket advice that on my podcast was not so great. Um, my paid stuff's been was just fine this yeah. year. Still, still working out pretty well. But yes, it was definitely a year where you know there was a pretty big favorite, and that might have been hard to see just because they're not a not as brand name a program as you know the usual teams that that we see as the the favorite in the tournament. But uh, they've lived up to it, right? I don't. They have yet to. They've covered every single game. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. So, well, it's easy to cover when you win by 20 every week or every yeah. game. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and I keep saying, you know, there, someone's going to give them a game. Yeah. Uh, I don't know when that's going to be. I really don't think it's going to be UCLA. Uh, but, I mean, you never know, obviously. Right. But uh, they're going to have to play poorly and someone's going to have to play really well. And that could still happen. Uh, we're going to talk with Adam, though, about Gonzaga versus the field, a fun bet available on FanDuel Sportsbook. Get his thoughts on that. Uh, but also last week, I had NASCAR for the Bristol Dirt Race, and it actually wound up being more predictable than I thought because the thought process was it'd be super high variance. Uh, we wouldn't have a good read on who would do well. If I look at my my model for the race, it performed better than I thought. So if I had played things more straight up, might have done better. I was on Tyler Reddick at 20 to 1, close at 18, so a tiny bit of value there. The problem that Reddick had is that qualifying got rained out, which meant that he started 27th. And because he's a good dirt racer, I thought that he'd start further up because they were supposed to have qualifying on Saturday and the heat races. Didn't happen. Started 27th. He took a long way to work his way forward and eventually got his way in the top 10, run the top five, finished seventh. Couldn't quite push hard enough to get the win. I think that the qualifying aspect there, it just took him so long to work his way forward, pick his way through traffic. There were so many cautions. There weren't a lot of, you know, green flag chances for him to work his way forward. So some tough luck there. Still got closing line value. It wasn't the worst bet by any means because the two favorites did crash out. But either way, I think that. More predictive than I thought, and that's something that I'll be applying to next year when they go back to Bristol, where I can actually have more faith in my numbers next year than I thought I would, which is an interesting takeaway and a bit counter to what I was expecting for that race. We're going to talk to Adam Stanko here in just one second, but first, hey, baseball fans, opening day finally here Thursday. That means it's time for Daily Fantasy Baseball. There is no better place to play than on FanDuel. For only $4, you can have a chance to compete for part of the $500,000 prize pool with first place taking home $100,000. Set your lineup by Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern to compete in Daily Fantasy Baseball. Head over to FanDuel and start the season off right. For more details, visit FanDuel or download the FanDuel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's talk about the men's Final Four now with Adam Stanko. Once again, follow him on Twitter at NaismithLives. Check him out on the Rejecting the Screen podcast and check out his NBA draft work on ESPN as well. We're talking about the Final Four and a, co- a little bit about the NBA futures market too coming off of last week's trade deadline. Covering the present. Let's welcome Adam Stanko back into covering the spread to get you set for the men's final four coming up on Saturday. Adam, I appreciate the time. How are you doing today? I'm great. It's always great to talk to you and to talk to my old high school buddy whenever I get the chance. Yeah, we got the we got the the inside dish on Ed last time because I, I think that that's just required having high school buddies on the air here for sure. So that, that's definitely a good thing. Uh, but I also want to talk to you, Adam, about like how the tournament's gone for you because you got brackets. You know, you're giving analysis or Veasan and stuff like that. How have things been for you with this tournament? Have you found it to be more mixed for you than usual, or do you feel like you've had a pretty good grasp on things despite the volatility with this weird year? Uh, I don't think that I've had a good grip on, on how the tournament's <laughs> played out. Uh, you know, it's weird because the evaluations that, that I do are typically based upon, well, they are, they're always based upon, you know, what's happened in past tournaments. And so we sort of have, well, the tournament itself becomes this tiny sample size. Over time, you can figure out, uh, especially from a psychological perspective, sort of how teams are playing, what, what will breed success in the tournament. And I always point to my five factors. You need an NBA level point guard, um, multiple NBA players, uh, multiple three point shooters, a rim protector and a go to scorer. And those things still apply uh, and they're still uh, a part of having success. But I think now you factor in no fans or at least very limited fans. And now all of a sudden role players can step up in different ways that we wouldn't have seen in tournaments past where they would have been a little bit too nervous to play. And also 
there's no momentum swings that I think we felt like we would see typically because of a crowd. And what I'm really seeing is teams that close out the first half really strongly and end up building these big leads are sustaining those. And uh, I think I think I think opponents are also allowing for sort of this late rush at the end of a half, because, again, you don't feel like it's as big, at least the players on the court don't for the moment at hand. Yeah, and, and I just want to bring up, you know, watching the Michigan-UCLA uh, game last night, we, you know, Adam, you talked about this on my podcast about Michigan's weakness. Like, they don't have an NBA-level point guard, and they didn't really have a go-to score last night. I mean, they thought that, I guess maybe they thought they had a go-to score, but uh, it didn't really work out. And that and that's the type of analysis that, you know, you definitely provide, and it really kind of reared its head last night in, in a game that Michigan should have won but just couldn't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was the thing for me. I mean, Isaiah Livers, you look at in this tournament, we're sort of waiting for when would it hit them that they didn't have a go-to score. And what I always point out with that is it's not just about five seconds left, who are you going to to break his guy down and, and score, but more so, hey, there's four minutes left, there's eight minutes left, or momentum has started to shift a little bit. Where are we going out of our structured offense to just go to someone who can find a way to, to score, whether they reject a ball screen or whether we run a play for them or what have you. We just need to get the ball in someone's hands to go get us a bucket to calm things down. And obviously you saw last night, I don't know what it was at, I think the last eight shots Michigan missed, but they were looking for someone who is going right. to be that guy. Um, and, um, you know, it certainly wasn't Wagner on that three-point attempt, I can tell you that much. No, it wasn't, too, and, and Hunter Dickinson's their best player, and he had a really good stretch at the beginning of the second half where he got a bunch of buckets, and then he missed one, and they kind of went away from him, and, uh, you know, that's where I was kind of like, no, stop, you know, he, he's your best player. At least, at least work it into him, and he got a little bit predictable with how he was shooting it, but, you know, at least get it into him, and he's, he's a really good passer getting it out of there. They kind of got away from that, and then, you know, things just got away from them. They just they they did not have a good game on offense. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I think that we saw that, and I, to me, the number was the magic number was eighty. If if UCLA could hold Michigan under eighty points, they were going to have a chance to win that game and to do the job defensively that they did. And I thought that I I thought Juwan Howard drew up some good stuff. I liked the offense that they kind of ran for the most part. I mean, you point out about about how much they were going to Dickinson, but just in general terms. Uh, it just seemed to be that when they needed something late, it's just that collection of guys that was good in terms of everyone contributing uh, yeah. had served them well the first couple rounds. But it just, you know, they needed just a go to score and they didn't have it. Now, you were talking about the differences with the tournament this year with no fans and the impact that has. But also with you, we are doing NBA draft stuff and COVID can impact that, too. So how have things been different for you from an NBA draft prep perspective with potentially decreased availability and stuff like that, how has it impacted your analysis and your ability to do your research, given that there may be just some extra obstacles this year? Well, it, it's interesting from a draft perspective, because this whole thing started at the beginning of COVID, where it was really difficult to analyze players, because you know people think that it's all about the on-court performance and productivity, and that's what NBA prospects are evaluated on. But interviews are absolutely critical. Uh, in-person interviews, which obviously didn't happen. They happened over Zoom, so that still took place. You still got to know the kids on some level, but typically the interview portion has become the most important part, part of the combine, actually, for the for the NBA draft. A lot of people don't don't realize that. Uh, and, then, and then individual workouts with teams is the other main component of, of draft research and, and data. And again, that was missing from the process last year where teams weren't able to individually work out guys. They are going to be able to do it this year. There were some instances where they did some of that, uh, but really it wasn't on a grand scheme, uh, grand level. And, and, and for me personally, I go down to L.A. every summer. Don McLean works out. Um, people may remember him as NBA's most improved player, UCLA, Pac-12's all-time leading scorer. But Don has become like the preeminent workout guru and has had everybody, um, Donovan Mitchell, Carl Anthony Towns, um, Paul George, even back in the day, Adam Morrison. He's, he's worked out so many different players and really just preparing them for how the NBA game is different than the college game. And I think that's, a, that's something a lot of people don't realize, you know, how valued three-point shooting is, the role that you'll play at the next level, and those are the skills he works on. And so 
that's the part of the process this year that we'll we'll get to evaluate. But in terms of this year uh, and being limited during the college season, I, I think we've just seen sort of without fans, it's we've seen uh, role players of what their maximum capability is. I think that's the difference, really. It's and so the elite guys are always going to perform well, regardless of what the situation is. But for the role guys, that's what's what's really changed. Is all of a sudden you see some role players gain confidence, and you say, "Oh, I didn't realize his ceiling was there. Oh, now we have to start looking at him in a different way." Excellent. Uh, let's talk about some of the Final Four games. We have Houston versus Baylor. Baylor's a five-point favorite with a total of uh, 135. Uh, I think these are. These are two really interesting teams, Houston and Calvin Sampson and, and Baylor and Scott Drew. Uh, how do you think this one evolves? Well, obviously, Houston has had an interesting path to get to the Final Four. I mean, without playing right a single-digit seed, uh, really hasn't played much competition in general all year. I mean, just a couple tournament teams, and you think about – uh, Wichita State, and then uh, there was one other earlier in the year that's the only other team that, that they faced that's actually in this field. But I will say I love what Kelvin Sampson does defensively. Ed, you and I have talked about what I think. The, I think the world of him as a head coach, I think he's one of the best coaches in all of college basketball, if not the best right now, just because I, I believe it's all about buy-in and how he gets his kids to play at such a high level on the defensive end, the effort, the fact that they play for each other, which is huge. The fact that they understand their specific roles uh, in in a in the team structure, and so the thing with Houston is defensively they're going to cause you nightmares. They're going to take away your best player. They're going to take away your abilities to score in different capacities. But you know we saw what they did to Buddy Beheim, um, and you'll just see that with this Houston team, they are not going to allow your best player to to beat them. The problem is they really don't have that many scores. They they essentially, um, you know, Quentin Grimes, the the Kansas transfer, is an unbelievable high level scorer. He's going to get his, and they're going to look to get him at all three levels of the offense. But but it's the other guys that they really need to step up. Jero, who is more of a distributor at this point, but also contributes points wise, uh, and then Sasser, and those three guys all have to play a role. And in in Houston's rare losses. Or even in their close games, as you see with, when they eked one out to Rutgers, one of those big three shot poorly from three. So they sort of need all three of those guys because they don't score enough. And it's against a Baylor team that has so many weapons, especially on the perimeter. And you think about uh, Teague and Mitchell and, and Butler and then, you know, uh, Mayer. And, and th- these, they have so many offensive weapons. They want to get out and run with you. I think Houston will stop them from running, but Houston's going to have to just make shots in order to keep Baylor from from pushing the pace. So I think Houston hangs around, um, and I think if this game gets close late, I actually like Houston's execution late in games better than I do Baylor. So I think Houston upsets Baylor, um, and I think they, they keep the scoring low. But on the flip side, I would not be shocked if all of a sudden Baylor hits some early shots, Houston falls behind, and has no chance to get back in it. Does that worry you with Houston, the the idea where they could be out of things early? Because you kind of want teams that can win in multiple ways, and it seems like they may be more one-dimensional, where you, you can't have the come-from-behind type win. Does that concern you with if you were you know thinking about a pregame bet on Houston? Does that worry you knowing that they may not be positioned to make a comeback? It, it doesn't worry me for the fact that it's really hard to get a big lead on them in general because mm-hmm. – I mean, look, any team at any point in time can make tough shots. So that and that's what has to happen. But you but I know going into this game, they're going to make it extremely tough for Baylor uh, to get the shots that that Baylor wants. And so because of that, now all of a sudden Baylor does have a bunch of weapons. But because of that, it's going to be really difficult for Baylor to score. I don't expect them to run up and down. It's just that if they were to hit some tough shots, they can do that. But the other thing Houston really does is a great job on the boards, too. And they're going to get offensive rebounds. So even if when Houston's not making shots, they're sort of aware that they're not a very good offensive team. And having that identity actually helps. It's not like they think they're a great offensive team and then they hit struggles and say, oh, no, we're in trouble. What do we do? And there's a state of panic. It's more goes the other way where they sort of expect that they're going to miss shots. They sort of expect that they're going to have some struggles offensively. They know that the games are going to be tight. They know that it's going to be a rock fight. And it's just how prepared is their opponent for that situation. 
And when you play like that the whole season, you are in your comfort zone when you're when you're like that. I think that's reassuring for sure. Let's move now to UCLA against Gonzaga. Gonzaga, 14-point favorite here. Total is 145 at FanDuel Sportsbook. And you were on Visa last week, and you said UCLA was live as a dog, as a team to potentially win that game, and they did. Now they're playing Gonzaga, though. Gonzaga is a different beast. So do you see UCLA hanging around here, or is this just another blowout waiting to happen for Gonzaga? I think Gonzaga wins by about 15. <laughs> um, I think I think UCLA has been awesome under Mick Cronin. And, and, and what they've done, when you consider the fact that Chris Smith was supposed to be a first-round pick early in the season, they lose him to a season-ending injury. Late in the season, they lose Jalen Hill. They then collapse in their last four games, three of which were in the regular season and then their Pac-12 tournament game. They had big leads in all four of those games. If they keep if they keep those leads, we look at UCLA as a completely different team coming into the tournament, certainly not where they were seated. Part of the issue might have been Mick Cronin said to them he didn't want to play in the conference tournament. He wanted to get straight to the NCAA tournament. He was preparing his guys, he knew, and their defense has, has gone up a notch. I mean, this is a defense that gave up 68 points a game uh, this season, that's higher than Cronin's teams ever gave up at Cincinnati. But they have this weird, interesting mix where they have a really steady point guard in Tiger Campbell. They have these two wing scorers who are excellent in Jaime Hawkes uh, and Johnny Juzang, who went off, obviously, in their Elite Eight matchup. They're kind of an offensive team. They're sort of built where they're good on offense, but yet now they've got some of Mick Cronin's identity as a defensive team. It's interesting because sometimes you bring a a coach with a new identity, the first couple of years, they're going with the old coach's players, but yet the new coach's mindset, it sort of becomes best of both worlds, as opposed to three, four years from now, the UCLA teams are going to be way more grinded out, way more Houston-like than this UCLA team is. So it's a good mix. But all that being said, Gonzaga causes a bunch of problems for you because they can score in so many different ways. And what's really fascinating, and they did this against USC, if any team was going to have a shot, it would be USC to slow them down because of the defensive issues that Mobley presents. But what you have to do against Gonzaga is you have to limit your live ball turnover so they don't get out and run, and you also have to make shots so they don't go out and run. Same issue that Houston's going to have with Baylor, except UCLA is not on the same defensive level that, that, uh, that Houston is. UCLA has played well defensively, but I don't think that we're going to see the same effort from Johnny Juzang. I don't think he's going to be just lights out shooting the ball. And then also... I just think that Gonzaga has so many more weapons that are going to even score easier on UCLA than they did even against USC. I mean, Drew Timmy was taking Evan Mobley, the best defensive player in all college basketball, to school. Like, it, it was incredible what he was able to do. And the big thing to watch is off misses or off turnovers, Jalen Suggs gets it and pushes it. And even if it's a secondary break where not everybody's back yet, it's just the fact that as soon as they see there's numbers there, they look at that as a disadvantage, and they're willing to share the ball. Their perimeter, I mean, the guys on the perimeter are great. They just have so many weapons. And so I, I just see them winning by about 15 points. Great effort from UCLA in this tournament. I'd be stunned if they beat Gonzaga. I would agree. Uh, FanDuel Sportsbook does a pretty interesting bet. Uh, you can either bet Gonzaga at minus 190 or uh, the other three teams to, to win the national championship. Uh, do you see any value on either side of that? I really like Gonzaga. I mean, I, I think this Gonzaga team, if you told me that all they have to do is is beat um, UCLA and then either Houston or Baylor at the beginning, and you're talking about, you know, 190, I mean, that like, to me, I'm all over it. I Again, the idea that these guys have so many weapons, Jalen Suggs is going to be a top three pick. They have Joel Ayai, who is an NBA player in the backcourt, Andrew Nebhard, who's the Florida transfer, Another superstar. Corey Kispert might be the best shooter in college basketball. Um, a Antoine Watson, who's uh, sort of their jackknife glue guy in the front court. He's great defensively um, and gets some garbage points for them. Really high energy guy. And then Drew Timmy is, uh, you know, just like with Hunter Dickinson in Michigan and just like we see with Luka Garza, like guys that can really exploit defenses in college who are post-up players. They don't get to do that in the NBA because they don't run many post-ups. But Drew Timmy knows exactly who he is. He's got unbelievable footwork, drop steps. He can also shoot it till about 15 feet. Doesn't shoot a lot of threes because he doesn't need to do that. Knows exactly who he is, runs the floor. And so they just have so many weapons and ways to beat you. And if all else is lost, I mean, Jalen Suggs, the moment that the help defense doesn't come over, 
he's going to just blow by his guy and get a bucket himself. And he's also a wonderful distributor with great vision. So I just think they have so many weapons offensively. They're playing a really high level defensively. And it'd be a great game for them against Baylor or Houston. But I just think that they just have way too much. I, I love Gonzaga in this tournament, especially at this point in the tournament. So Adam is on Gonzaga, minus 190 versus the field to win the NCAA championship. Let's go to the NBA side of things. So as mentioned here, you're kind of well-positioned to talk about both sides of things here, given the analysis that you do. And we just had the trade deadline last week, and there was a lot of movement there. And markets have had time to catch up, but there could still be some lingering value out there. So are there any teams you're seeing as being either undervalued or overvalued in the futures market right now, based on what we saw last week? Well... You know, it's interesting. I, I think that the weird thing that I will say that sort of happened throughout the league, and this is almost away from even the trade deadline, but it more, well, it, it only speaks about it because players wanted to go there. The Brooklyn Nets right now, around the NBA, other teams really feel like the Nets are way ahead of everyone else. Nets are winning it this year. Like, they've almost, in a weird way, conceded it. So it's not so much the idea that you add you know, Blake Griffin to this roster or LaMarcus Aldridge, like their impact in the playoffs. I mean, that certainly we could see in a game or two. So I don't, I don't know if we saw the, the last few months, this, this idea that the rest of the team sort of the rest of the teams in the NBA, and they would never admit this publicly were conceding to the nets, but I would just say the idea that the nets, it's not the necessarily pieces that they brought in, but how they're playing right now. The fact that Kyrie Irving basically told James Harden publicly, hey, you're our point guard now. That was huge for that team. So instead of having some, you know, uh, rock group famous breakup, this team <laughs> is able to have, be more cohesive as the year went on. And and I think everyone else in the league is, is par- terrified of them. So, I mean, is it really that much? I mean, if LeBron comes back from the Lakers or uh, some of the teams in the West, you, you still think it's it's really the Nets right now? Yeah, I do. I, I think it's the Nets right now. I mean, there are obviously teams in the West who could – who could compete with them. There's no question. You look at what a, a fully healthy Lakers team is and, and certainly, um, and, you know, and even dropping down in the standings, we don't think home court's going to matter that much. Right. We talk about that the factor fans would typically play as we mentioned in college. And now of course, same thing holds true in the NBA. So home court advantage has sort of been nullified. Uh, the jazz have had a wonderful year. There are teams that that could challenge them coming out. Certainly Joel Embiid and, and company in, uh, in Philly. The Heat, I think, would be the other team that I would, I would point to and say now all of a sudden you're looking at a roster that really could do damage. You saw what they did in the bubble last year in the NBA Finals, and that was, you know, without their star players. I mean, the fact that Goran Dragic and Bam got hurt. This team could be excellent, and they are – they have the defense to compete. There's no question about it. And now having some some extra weapons. But I I still feel like that the Nets are so far and away better than than everyone else. I'd be I'd be shocked if the Nets don't win win the NBA title this year. All righty. So we are on the Nets here as an interesting team. They're plus two sixty at FanDuel Sportsbook. So definitely a team that the sportsbook has their eye on as well. But clearly the rest of the NBA does too. Now, Adam, mm-hmm. as far as the futures market, it's also pretty interesting right now because we talked. Uh, with Errol Epstein a couple weeks ago about the the futures market from an awards perspective. And it was like, okay, can anyone beat LeBron? Can anyone beat LaMelo for Rookie of the Year? And since then, unfortunately, they both gotten hurt, which stinks. Like, that 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 sucks. You know, we don't want that. But it, it opens up a lot of interesting stuff within those markets. Right now, Nikola Jokic is a favorite to win MVP. We've got Anthony Edwards, a slight favorite, to win Rookie of the Year. But that one's pretty wide open as well. Are you seeing any value in those markets given the injuries or is it one you're staying away from right now? Yeah, well, it's it's a really interesting point. I mean, I I it was funny because coming into the year, I thought we we might see Giannis win another MVP and then he puts up the numbers where you could make a case for Giannis, but it's it's so much about traction and and perception and what guys are doing in some highly profile games and all all those things. So so go through and say Right now, Joker is the, the, the favorite. I don't think there's, there's any question about him being the favorite right now. And I'd be, I'd be surprised if he doesn't come, come back with, with the MVP award. I mean, for a guy to be averaging essentially, I mean, I think it's 26, 11, and 8. Uh, we, we just have not seen numbers like that from a big. We've seen you know team success for them. And obviously, Joel Embiid is the other guy who is going to make a major push for, for the MVP race. But the one to me 
that I think is going to be really hard to deny here. And I would, I, I didn't think it was possible when I first brought it up. I mentioned it on our podcast, um, I think about a month and a half ago, it's James Harden. And, you know, people look at what happened early on in the season as part of the Rockets and was almost failing on his team. But he has been the most valuable player in the NBA this year. I mean, talk about the net success, but also just what he's doing on a nightly basis uh, to get everybody else involved. It, talking about just individual contributions. And it's now being appreciated by the national media. And that's the change that I didn't see happening before. So if there's someone who isn't Jokic to win it, and especially if the Nets end the season as the number one seed uh, and people like to go in that direction, I think there there's a very good chance that we could see Harden as as the MVP. And then the interesting one for me is, yes, Anthony Edwards brings up an, a good case. And, you know, Sadiq Bay might be a, a crazy long shot, let's say, for the Pistons, Tyrese Halliburton for the Kings. But I think what LaMelo Ball has done and he's going to try to get back on the court right now is where I'd be placing my money. I mean, LaMelo Ball, even if he doesn't play again, you're talking about a guy essentially 15, 6, and 6. Those numbers unheard of for a rookie. A 19-year-old rookie at that has has not happened. Um, so a spectacular season with just some spectacular games that he's had. He had a 30-point, 8 assists, 0 turnover game uh, earlier in the season, which, again, we had never seen from someone his age. So what he's been able to do and how he changed the culture somewhat – with that Hornets team, I think you factor all those things in. And even in spite of the injury, I also don't think Anthony Edwards is going to have a strong enough last push at the end of the season in order to bump him. So I think LaMelo, and even if he comes back, I mean, then it's a wrap. Um, but I think LaMelo, I think, is going to win even in spite of the injury. Yeah, if no one can take advantage of LaMelo being out, then it could just default to him even if he doesn't come back. He's plus 210 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. James Harden, 5-1. to one. couple interesting ones there for sure. That is Adam Stanko. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at NaismithLives. Uh, Adam, we appreciate the time. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the tournament. Enjoy the NBA draft process, and hopefully we'll have you on back again soon. Uh, Jim, Ed, it's, it's awesome. I appreciate it. I'm sorry this was after a Michigan loss. So everyone's a little down, but, uh, you know, I was no, hoping maybe good. we'd see the other direction. But always good being on with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Adam Stanko for swinging by and breaking down the men's Final Four and the NBA futures market, Ned. It's nice to have someone who has his, his hands in both buckets there, talking NBA, talking men's college basketball, and has that, that well-rounded knowledge, which is nice with draft people because they kind of have a good handle on both aspects. Absolutely. Uh, I've known Adam since high school and we talk a lot every year before the tournament and, you know, his input uh, definitely f uh, fuels my analysis, uh, you know, the non-quantitative side of things where I'm trying to get a, uh, a sense for a team's ceiling, a team's floor. Uh, I use a lot of his input. So uh, it's always great talking to him about basketball and, and today was no different. Absolutely. So make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at uh, Naismith Liz. Let's move now into covering the future. And Ed, you want to go back to the final four Houston against Baylor, the first game coming up on Saturday. What are you seeing in the betting markets there? Yeah. Before we talk about the markets, let's talk about the unique brand of basketball that Houston plays. So I was watching a video by hoop vision this week and they were talking about how Calvin Sampson understands that his team doesn't shoot that well. So what do they do to make up for it? Well, they absolutely excel at offensive rebounding and taking care of the basketball. So two of the other four factors. Um, their second, when I look at offensive rebounding rate, you, it was very clear that they could do that against Oregon State over the weekend. Their third in turnover rate, so very good at not turning over the ball. And what this means is they get a lot of field goal attempts on offense. Now, on defense, they, they play incredibly tough defense. They're, they're really good at uh, defense in general. And they are in a very aggressive team. I like to think of them as a pit bull that bites your leg and, and never lets go. But one of the consequences of that is that they do foul. So when I look at free throw rate or free throw attempts divided by field goal attempts, and then I make my schedule adjustments, they're 323rd. Okay, So they foul a lot. Um, and so basically, they're happy to foul you and not give you that field goal attempt on, on average. right? So when you put this together, they get more shots than average on offense. They allow fewer shots on average on defense. Um, when I looked into it, they get almost 10 more field goal attempts than their opponents this season per game. Think about that. You get, to sh you get a shot at the basket 10 more times with the way they play. And so even though you're not a great shooting team, 
you just you get a rebound you get you know you kick it out you get you get another shot so uh it's really interesting uh just the style that what they play um so i i'm kind of infatuated with this houston team i think they're really tough um and and i you know um and let's look at baylor so they played baylor they came into questions about their defense uh since their return from their covid pause and their defense has definitely been better during the tournament they held wisconsin and villanova below a point per possession uh, which is good. Arkansas was just over at 1.05 points per possession. You, the college basketball average is roughly one. So, you know, Baylor's obviously a great team. They're favored. They're favored by my numbers. I feel like this game is going to come down to three-point shooting. Uh, as I mentioned before, Houston doesn't really shoot that well, but that doesn't really stop them from firing it up. Uh, they take 42% of their field goal attempts from three. And Baylor has been a great three-point shooting team this year. Uh, but their current rate of 41% on making threes has already regressed from higher rates earlier this season. Um, you know, and they've made 36% of their three point shots in the tournament. So, you know, which team can shoot better? Uh, I don't know. Th- three point shooting is, you know, the most impossible thing to predict. But what I do know is that my numbers like Baylor by about four points. Uh, I, from watching these two teams play, I, I definitely like Houston. I think they're going to give Baylor all they can handle. I like Houston to cover the the plus five. Uh, there's reduced juice right now uh, over on FanDuel. Um, and uh, I wouldn't wait too long if you want to bet Houston. Yeah, plus five is minus 106 right now over at FanDuel Sportsbooks. If you want to get Houston, uh, like Ed said, that number may be moving based on the juice there. And I think, Ed, it's nice – as numbers people to see a coach who recognizes weaknesses and strengths and adjusts to account for those. And it's kind of like, it's a math problem. You know, when you take that many threes and also when you give yourself that many opportunities, you're just giving yourself more chances at points. So, you know, Houston has deficiencies, but it's nice to see a team that can self scout enough to know how they can make up for those deficiencies. Yeah, no, it, it's good to know your strengths and weaknesses. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if Calvin Sampson actually recruits to this. Right. He recruits to guys that are tough, that are physical and athletic. And and that's what you see on that team. Now, I mean, that 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 also describes Baylor as well. Um, Maybe the toughness a little bit less since their their COVID pause. But, you know, Baylor is also a very athletic team. I mean, I think these are I think these are two reasonably matched teams. I think it's going to be a great game. I think it goes down to the wire. Uh, Yeah. So we'll see what happens. And you said your numbers have Gonzaga by 12 or 13. Is that enough where you're going to actually bet UCLA, or is it more so saying you're not going to bet Gonzaga? Uh, My numbers have uh, Gonzaga by about 13. Yeah, I have no interest in betting UCLA. Good. So it's good to know when you want to stay away and stuff like that, and that's uh, worthwhile knowledge uh, for this weekend. So it should be a fun one. Ed likes Houston plus five against Baylor. My cover in the future for this weekend is talking baseball because we're not going to get a lot of chances this year to do individual MLB games because we record. We want these episodes to be more evergreen, longer shelf life. But hey, we're talking opening day. It's tomorrow, so I'm going to dive into one here. And my favorite bet for opening day is is the Orioles' money line at plus 146 against the Red Sox. And this game is in Fenway, so that is an edge for Boston. But I really like the Orioles' starter here, John Means. He had a big velocity jump last year, and initially it didn't really lead to much, got off to a really rough start. And velocity in a vacuum doesn't really matter, but when you do something with it, it does. And he did that something down the stretch. Something really changed for him in his final four starts. And specifically, Means leaning more on his curveball. And the big issue he had had previously is that he would get to two strikes, couldn't get that third strike, couldn't get that out pitch. But that curveball was his put-out pitch last year. He had a 38% strikeout rate on that curveball, according to Baseball Savant. So featuring that pitch more should lead to good things, and it definitely did. Because in that four-star stretch, Means had a 2.74 skill interactive ERA. That is a tremendous number, and you're not going to project it at that number for the full year. It's a four-star sample, which I can buy into. I'm not going to project it to be exactly that, though. I can expect it to be pretty good and potentially undervalued by the market, so which I think is what we're seeing here with this number. If Means can add strikeouts, he could be a really good pitcher. Always been a guy who's been good at suppressing hard contact, so if he can add one more thing to his repertoire, that could be a new level for him. I also don't think the Orioles' offense is that bad. They had a 108 WRC plus against righties last year based on the current active roster, and that number doesn't include Trey Mancini. He is back this year for this Orioles' offense, missed all of last year, so 
I think Means will pitch well, and I think this offense might be able to do something against uh, Nathan Eovaldi on the other side, too. So the money line is plus 146 in favor of the Orioles. I do like that. I also expect this to be pretty low scoring. Uh, temperature there is in the low 50s at Fenway. That's better for pitching than offense. So uh, the total there is nine runs. I'll take the under there at minus 102 at FanDuel Sportsbook. So the Orioles money line at plus 146 and the under nine runs minus 102 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Ed, you grew up in the Philly area. So are you a Phillies fan then or no baseball ties for you? Oh, no, I was a Phillies fan. I still okay. remember Mitch Williams giving up the home run to Joe Carter in the 1990-something World Series. It still hurts. Yep. But they could be fun this year. You get to watch Aaron Nola. You get to watch Bryce Harper. Like, those are two of my favorite players in all of baseball. That helps at least, right? Yeah, for sure. I need to I need to be working on some baseball numbers after we get off here. So. Oh, so you're actually going to do it before, before the Final Four starts. You're not going to wait till after the tournament? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've gotten some, I've gotten some emails asking me about it. So we'll see. We'll see what I get to after the show today. The people want what they want, Ed. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll let Ed go and get working on his numbers. But once again, a big thank you to Adam Stanko for swinging by and breaking down the men's final four and the NBA futures market. Follow Adam on Twitter at Naismith lives. Big thank you to him as always. Ed, uh, outside of updating your baseball numbers, what's going on for you over at the power rank? I'm still offering sample of my best predictions over at my free email newsletter. You can check it, that out at thepowerrank.com. You can also check out Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you with your final four bets, your opening day bets. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> 